Our speaker to this weekend is Dr. Alan Strange. He teaches church history at uh, Mid-America Reform Seminary in Dyer, Indiana. He is also the associate pastor at New Covenant Community OPC in Joliet, Illinois. Um, he's an active churchman. Uh, Alan has been involved in many, many different committees and projects. In fact, he was one of the key people involved in the Psalter Hymnal Project that produced the Psalter Hymnal that we sing from. And so please welcome Dr. Alan Strange. Thank you, Reverend DeYoung. It's always fun to come into these pulpits after tall Dutchmen have been here and you're it's obviously constructed for them, you know. I feel like I should be lecturing on, you know, Lord of the Rings and I'm a hobbit or something like that. But uh, I do thank this church and its session for its gracious invitation uh, to come here and to speak. I was here, I didn't look specifically, I think it was about a decade ago. Uh, I was here and I did uh, these talks and I was just talking to Reverend DeYoung about that. Uh, I did uh, one on Machen, uh, so we will get to that again in, in a little bit. But our focus is going to be Charles Hodge, and he said he'll have that book there. Uh, and the, the second book, uh, he doesn't perhaps have a copy. I didn't know he didn't have one. I'll, may, maybe I'll be able to leave this one with him. I'll Remind me, and I'll just leave this one with you as a little present. The Imputation of the Act of Obedience of Christ in the Westminster Standards. There's some implications of what I'm, I'm saying today here even in this volume, uh, but this volume is a much smaller volume. It's, uh, the total is only 176 pages. It's smaller. It's much cheaper. It's readable. Um, it, Dr. Venema, who also published a volume in this series, when this volume came out just recently, this one came out two years ago, and he looked at this and he said, this is good, Dr. Strange. This is a volume people might actually read. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at any rate... Uh, there is that one too, and please don't steal that one. It does, because it will also be stealing Reverend DeYoung's at this point. It does remind me of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who some, you know, some years ago, during his life, which was some years ago, he was at a free Methodist church as a young man preaching. And the practice of the church was, you think of a, a stipend or an honorarium, you know, for the fellow there preaching. Their practice was, at the end, to take an offering, you send your hat around, literally. So he, you know, had a top hat. Send the hat around, and that's, that's what you get for coming there and preaching. So it was a small group, and, and um, he, he sent the hat around, and you preach, you pray when the hat comes back. And the hat came back with nothing in it. So he prayed, and he thanked God for many things, and that these dear people did not steal his hat. <laughs> so <laughs> they didn't steal Spurgeon's hat. You don't steal <laughs> these books. Well, let's, uh, let's begin, if we may. The first talk is going to be on, it's entitled, Charles Hodge, Another Theologian of the Holy Spirit. Charles Hodge, another theologian of the Holy Spirit. Now, that should have you a little curious, so just stay there. We're going to read uh, one of the great Bible passages that have to do with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2. Now, I should say, in neither of these talks, lest there be any confusion or disappointment, I, I mean, I don't know what everybody who has ever come here has done, but when I'm asked to give historical talks, I mean... I don't just give you a sermon masquerading as a... I'm a historian, so I know how to give a historical talk. So these aren't sermons. So if you're saying, well, there's lots of stuff you didn't talk about from the scripture passage you read. I'm not preaching a sermon. I'm going to read this scripture passage, and I'm going to give you a talk. I'm not going to preach a sermon. That's tomorrow. You can, if I don't tomorrow treat the Bible text, come after me with everything you got. Okay, that's, it's be fair game. But that's not what we're doing this morning. But we're going to read 1 Corinthians 2 and have a word of prayer. And I, 
Paul speaks by the Holy Spirit. When I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him. So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we've not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught By the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who's understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And Paul ends there. And of course, what he has said before in the chapter answers the question if when you end and you say, how do we have the mind of Christ? He's given you the answer. In and by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how you have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for this day. And... It may seem a little odd just off the bat to say this beautiful day because it's, we could imagine better outward days. But Lord, it is a beautiful day. It is a lovely day because you've given us life and breath and you've given us much more than that. You've given us the Lord Jesus Christ. All his merits and mediation applied to us by the Holy Spirit who brings us to Christ and Christ to us. Thank you for this glorious work you have done. We rest in it, we rejoice in it, we delight in it. Help us, Lord, as we, as we look now at in the, this bit of time and the next at the ministry of the Spirit and particularly Charles Hodge and his place in that and some of his work and contribution to the reformed churches. We pray all of this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Well, Charles Hodge, as we've said, another theologian of the Holy Spirit. Another, I'll not keep you on tenterhooks anymore. Another because John Calvin, 1509 to 1564, was the first such theologian. Now, of course, Reverend DeYoung rightly oriented us. This is a Reformation conference. And so we're going to begin the first part of this talk is going to situate us reformationally. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to just jump to the 19th century where Charles Hodge is, right? And not get you there. I'm a historian. We always get you there. My wife, is, my wife says I'm getting better because she I used to be always the case. I was asked any question, we started with Adam and worked our way forward. Well, there's so many ways in which you rightly should start with Adam and work your way forward. But, you know, it, it was a bit long all the time to do that. So Calvin was called the theologian of the Holy Spirit by Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield in 1909 at the 400th anniversary of Calvin's birth. Now, in fact, you know, when I was here last time, maybe it was just the year after that, you probably had somebody for the 09 for Calvin. But you recall in in 2009, that was the 500th anniversary, right, of the birth of John Calvin. Well, a century earlier, 
Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, B.B. Warfield, of Princeton. We're going to be talking about Princeton. That's where Hodge taught. Now, B.B. Warfield was a successor to Hodge, not his immediate successor. His immediate successor was his son, A.A. Hodge. And then there was B.B. Warfield and then C.C. Winans. Now, that that's really has nothing to do with that. And, and, and some, many of them there had D.D.'s and E.E. E. Cummings and F.F. F. Bruce and <laughs> G.G. Thank heavens for little girls. No, we won't just, we won't keep going down this path, uh, though I would like to. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. But Warfield, um, in reflecting on Calvin, calls him the theologian of the Holy Spirit. And there's a reason, and we're going to see that. Let's back up from there. Let's back up from Calvin to see why he gets called the theologian of the Holy Spirit. Why does it somebody earlier in the church, why does it Augustine get called that, or, or Anselm, or some earlier theologian? Well, in the ancient church, now we say when we go back to the ancient church, we're talking the period historians would put this, they differ, but let's just for our purposes say that's the year 95 AD to about 600. We'll call that the ancient church. Again, the, you know, nobody at the time was saying, hey, we're in the ancient church. I mean, this is something historians look back on. or like, oh, it just changed to the medieval period. Like today, you change your clock. Did everybody notice that? We're now in the medieval. That's not the way it happened. I know you know that. But we sometimes read this stuff like it sort of did. Uh, these are just helpful handles for us in understanding this stuff. Um, but in the ancient church, a clear doctrine of the work, notice what I say, of the work of the Holy Spirit was largely absent. Now, there were people in the 4th century, Basil of Caesarea, Basil the Great, he was one of the Cappadocian fathers. Now, I, I said, if some of you hadn't had your coffee, I didn't say cappuccino, I said Cappadocian. He was one of the Cappadocians, and he wrote a great work on the Holy Spirit. And his work on the Holy Spirit really was very clear that the Holy Spirit is a person and is God. And you might say, well, why would you need to even say that? Well, this is a complicated subject. The Old Testament, the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. And the New Testament, the Greek word is pneuma. And both of these words mean, you might say in their first instance, breath, wind, wind as in... And, of course, Jesus gives that illustration, doesn't he, in John 3, when he talks about the new birth. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us new birth, and he talks about the wind. And that's why, because it's the same word. Now, what was Jesus was probably speaking Aramaic, but we get it in the Greek, right? It's the same word. So, you've got a real question. Is this, is this Holy Spirit, this, this one, call that, is he a person? He could be a force, of, you know, may the force be with you. No, that's not, well, see, there's a lot of people that think this. This is impersonal. He's, the, he's, a, he's an influence, some people said. No, the early church said, as we go to God's word, we see that Jesus is of the same substance with the Father, and so is the Holy Spirit. He's a person, and he's of the same substance. So they were very clear about that. And in fact, the, the, the council where they said Jesus is of the same substance with the Father for the first time, that was Nicaea. That was the first council after the Jerusalem council. That was in 325. Sometimes people say, why didn't you have a first council until 325? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. But one of them is the church was still being persecuted until 312 when Constantine was converted. In 313, he issued the Edict of Milan saying, Christians can worship! Now, had Christian, the Christian bishops gotten together in 300, you talk about Diocletian or Galerius, all they would have had to say is, get them! Go and kill them all! I mean, you understand that? They couldn't just openly meet. So these things all have answers. I mean, I love to say this because there's all kind of people nowadays who tell Dan Brown. You know Da Vinci Code? Do you know this stuff? He plays off of your ignorance. Our, yes, all of our ignorance. Most people are ignorant of the early church. 
I mean, you want, shall, we, shall I give you a test? I mean, <laughs> you want a test on the early church? See how well you know it? No. He plays off of that and tells you all kind of lies about the early church. So you read these books, you know, like, <gasps> no, 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 no. We've got answers to all of this stuff. Just, just calm down and do some research. And, and don't just read that kind of stuff, right? So it all has answers. This is not what he presents it as. It's a lie. The devil hates the truth. He always has and he always will. Started way back. And that's, not, that's new. It's not new. Started in Eden. He hates the truth. Hath God said? He's been going around saying that. Has God said? He says it now. PhDs in the university. Has God said? You know. So that it was the next council, Constantinople I in 381, that really dealt with the question, the question of Jesus being of the same substance with the Father was dealt with at Nicaea. And then the next council, 381, Constantinople, dealt with the Holy Spirit being fully God over against the spirit fighters, as they were called. The, the, there's a big fancy word for that, and it's fine to say these things. Pneumatomachians. Pneumatomachians. Spirit fighters. Fighters, these are people who oppose the deity of the Holy Spirit. So be really clear that doctrine pertaining to the person of the Holy Spirit was fully affirmed, but his work, what the work of the Holy Spirit is, remain underdeveloped. Notice the words I'm using. They're carefully chosen, not absent, underdeveloped in the ancient and medieval church. You say, well, when does the medieval run to? Well, about the Reformation. So let's say the medieval is running to about 1500. Say about 600 to 1500. And then, of course, Martin Luther, you know, a couple of days ago, but back in 1517, right? A couple of days ago, but back in 1517, he or some surrogate were putting those 95 theses on the chapel door uh, of the university church in Wittenberg, of the university chapel in Wittenberg. So, um, like the work of Christ, though, now here, this, is, this, it, it, this shouldn't trouble you because it's also the case, just I'm making now an, an analogy with this. I'm, we're talking about the person of the Holy Spirit, fully God, the work of the Holy Spirit, underdeveloped. The work of Christ also remained underdeveloped until the Middle Ages, until the 11th century with Anselm. Anselm develops the doctrine of the atonement. In the early church, many people thought of the doctrine of the atonement. Gregory, uh, the great, uh, the Cappadocians, many of them thought of the atonement as a ransom paid to the devil. So when Jesus came and died and shed his blood, the devil had gained a sort of right over mankind, and this was a ransom paid. And in the 11th century, Anselm says, no, the devil doesn't have this right. God's justice and offended honor is what needs to be satisfied. That's what needs to be answered to. It's God who was offended by our sin, and that needs to be answered to. But you see, that wasn't clearly set forth in that way. Notice the words. You leave here and say, well, he said they didn't even have a doctrine of the atonement. They, were all, they weren't even believers in the ancient church. I'll hunt you down if you say those kind of things. I didn't say anything of the sort. So pay attention to what I'm saying. You know, get it carefully here. So, but, but Anselm writes this great book. You may have heard of it. Cur Deus Homo. Cur Deus Homo is the Latin title. And that is not dog, God, and man. It is why the God-man. Why did God become a man, in other words? And Anselm says God became a man in order to bring man in his sin and misery back to a holy God and to do and to satisfy a holy God as only he could to bear the awful load of sin to use Bonar's words that none in heaven or earth could bear but God well the person of Christ was the focus of the first four councils they got the person of Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit very right in the early church and it's almost enough that they did that to understand that Christ as it as it's put finally at, in Chalcedon in 451, that Christ is two natures in one person without confusion, change, division, separation. This is pretty remarkable. They go to the word and there's all this error being taught and the church declares and proclaims the truth. 
Now, the work of the Holy Spirit didn't enjoy that kind of development in the Middle Ages. So we're saying that, that the work of uh, the person of Christ was, was grasped clearly in the ancient church, but it really took the Middle Ages to start to get a better understanding of what we will come to say in the Reformed faith is the penal substitutionary understanding of the atonement. Okay, And that comes into the Middle Ages. For the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, they understand the person of the Holy Spirit, but they don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit all through the Middle Ages. And in fact, if you look at something like Lombard Sentences, which is summarizing everything from the church up to that point, there is not a clear understanding of the work of the Spirit. But particularly, here's where you want to look if you're thinking, well, is this really the case? You look, who's the high watermark? of medieval theologians. There's pretty uniform agreement that the high watermark of medieval theologians is Thomas Aquinas. And if you look at his great work, uh, his great theological work, he's got a lot of works, but if you look at his Summa Theologica, right? That's his systematic theology. If you look at that, what you'll see is he goes from, a tr- he goes from the doctrine of God. Now, we, we typically in theology, we, we, we have... We start off with what's called prolegomena, doctrine of scripture and so forth. And then there's a logical development. We go doctrine of God, doctrine of man, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, doctrine of the church, doctrine of the last things. Okay, that's the typical order. And so if you look at Aquinas, he goes doctrine of God, doctrine of man, Doctrine of Christ, doctrine of the sacraments, and of the church. He overleaps the Holy Spirit. This is typical. This is typical. He tends to overleap the doctrine of the Spirit for the doctrine of the church. And ultimately in Rome, for Rome, the Roman Catholic Church is what I mean. I... You know, I find that I have to say these things. I, I, I was somewhere in a, in a, doing a conference and I kept saying Rome and they came up and said, what? I don't understand, what is Rome? What does the city of Rome have to do with all this? And I'm like, I mean the Roman Catholic Church. So if I say Rome without any further things, you know, I'm not talking about three coins and a fountain or whatever. I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church. So the Roman Catholic Church tends to replace the doctrine of the Holy Spirit with the doctrine of the church. In fact, the Pope, it's it's the case that till the Middle Ages, I mean, you don't really have the development of the papacy in the Middle Ages, and you have that development, but the Pope is called, and this changes with Gregory VII, the Bishop of Rome is called the Vicar of Peter. He's the sent one after Peter. But you might say, wait a minute, I thought he's called the Vicar of Christ. Yes, that's what he becomes with Gregory VII, he becomes the Vicar of Christ. The sent one. Well, does Christ have a vicar? Yes. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the vicar of Christ. He goes back to heaven. Read it. Read Luke. Read Acts. Those are two volumes, right? And you see what happens there. Christ ascends. And he sends his Holy Spirit. In new covenant power, this doesn't mean the Holy Spirit wasn't in the, no, this conference isn't talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the old. I mean, that's it's great stuff, but I just take, it, take my word for it that he had a ministry. I mean, do you think that anybody ever believed in God apart from a work of the Holy Spirit after the fall? I mean, come on. That would mean salvation isn't of grace. It's always of grace. So the Holy Spirit worked, but not in Pentecostal power. Until Pentecost, which has to do with applying Christ, which he wasn't applying before. He was applying the Christ looking forward. Now it's Christ who has come and done it. And not just to Jews, but to Jews and Gentiles and to all who believe on him. Right? Well, but what happened there with, say, Aquinas? What we see of Aquinas is there's... You go right from the doctrine of Christ to the doctrine of the church and the doctrine of the sacraments. And that means that the doctrine of the sacraments have to be ex opera operato. That is, by the working of the work. You have to have that kind of power in the sacraments themselves 
this isn't the person, the talk show person, but opera, operato means by the working of the work. It means when you receive the sacraments, unless you positively refuse the grace offered, you get it. Baptism, the Eucharist, you get the grace, and that's where you get it. But we say, what about the work of the sovereign spirit? Well, that's not understood. In the Roman Catholic Church, you see, just to say this, I love to ask my students here, what does Rome see as means of grace? And people will start naming the sacraments. And I say, stop. Can you show me anywhere in any piece of literature that Rome talks about means of grace? They don't call their sacraments means. That's the problem. The sacraments become ends in themselves. We call them means because everything is to lead to Christ. And if it doesn't, it means nothing. If you don't in, in these draw near and trust Christ, they have no efficacy. And it's the Spirit who draws. It's the sovereign Spirit who draws. This is why Calvin, in his institutes, is so revolutionary. Because where you have that missing work of the Holy Spirit in Aquinas. And be clear, Aquinas believed the Holy Spirit was God. No question about that. And he worked. He has some stuff about that work, but not like Calvin comes to have in the Institutes. And this is why you read the Institutes. People like us, you have study classes. Maybe you've done that here. You read the Institutes and you're like, yeah, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you, you read from book two, which is all about Christ. And it talks about the merits and mediation of Christ. And then you go to book three and Calvin says, as long as... As Christ remains outside of us, he does us no good. All this work that he's done for us, his active obedience, his passive obedience, it does us no good as long as he remains outside of us. And you're like, Calvin, what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about something that hasn't been clearly talked about. And he says it's the Holy Spirit. Book three is about the Holy Spirit. Book four is about the church. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit precedes the doctrine of the church. This has to do with what we're going to talk about in Hodge. This has to do with what we're going to talk about in the next talk, which is the spirituality of the church. And the reason we talk about the spirituality of the church and the reason the spirituality of the church is what it is is because the church is a, an essentially spiritual institution. It's a spiritual institution. It is an institution that is formed by the Holy Spirit taking what is Christ's and applying it to us. Bringing, as he puts it, as I said earlier, bringing Christ to us and us to Christ. And so when you read this in book, as you transition and you read this in book three of Calvin, you need to know you're reading something very revolutionary. This is, this is why at least at some point you, have, you need to have historians come in and tell you. Because you, we read these great things and they're not contextualized that way. Sometimes people don't say, do you recognize how wonderful and, 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 and fresh and revealing this was? This was a real advance. All Calvinists thereafter are theologians of the Holy Spirit. This is true of Calvin's successors of the later 16th century and the Reformed Confessions. Now let me just say this. In a way, it should be noted not true of Luther and his successors. Say, so, well, well, didn't Luther and Calvin agree? Justification by faith alone? Absolutely. And they agreed on many essentials. Please hear carefully. All right? They grasped justification by faith alone. Beautifully so. Luther. But not the fuller work of the Spirit. Not only in justification but in sanctification. Now let me just say this. You understand that when you're working through this systematic theology that I mentioned, doctrine of God, doctrine of man, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, where the doctrine of justification falls is in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Because justification is about the Spirit applying the merits and mediation of Christ to us. Christ, our sin is imputed to Him. Well, let's go back. It's a triple imputation, right? Adam's, the guilt of Adam's first sin is imputed to the whole human race. Bad news. Really bad news. I, 
I, I don't want to burst your bubble in case you didn't know what happened in Eden. He ate the fruit. He wasn't supposed to. He did. Spoiler alert, okay? And things have been a mess ever since, huh? Right? You want to, why is the world a mess? There you go. There you go. He ate that fruit. He disobeyed. And God imputed the guilt of that first sin to the whole human race. As in Adam all died. And then he graciously and lovingly he imputes the sins of his people of the elect to Jesus Christ. He bore that on the cross for you and me. He paid the full measure of our sin. He took the wrath of God that we deserved that burned hot against our sin. He who had done nothing amiss and the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53, saw it all. All we like sheep had gone astray. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. But not only was that imputed to him, not only did he die on the cross, he lived for us. That's what I'm really talking about in this book a lot. I'm not just trying to promote this book. I think this is an encouragement to us. That he didn't just die for us, he lived for us. You all know this. You all know this. This isn't an odd thing. It's like, you know, if you tell your kid to clean up the room. You young people here, you know, go clean your room. You know, you need to clean your room. We're going to go over to the game at 6 o'clock. And you come in at 5 and the room isn't clean. Well, you're going to have to stay here with your sister. She's doing homework. You're not going to the game. So there's your punishment. But then what does, who knows, who could have thought this would happen? Mom or dad says, now clean your room. What? I mean, God doesn't only require that we pay the penalty for our sin, right? He requires that we positively keep the law. Again, let's say, you know, I've, I've, if you listen to the interview that I had with my publicist back here, Brother Busey, about this book, I, give so, I talk about these things. Don't pay the IRS. Now, I'm not actually suggesting you don't pay the IRS. But try this. If, if you think, well, that doesn't make sense. If you don't pay the IRS, they're going to give you they're going to interest and penalties. So let's say you owe them a thousand bucks, and they have interest and penalties, and they give you get the letter. Well, try pay the interest and the penalties, and say, okay, we're good now, right? I paid the penalties. I paid the interest. I mean, that's the that's the that's the penalty for not o obeying. I mean, Jesus going to the cross. That's the penalty for not obeying. The IRS is very unreasonably going to say, you gotta pay the thousand bucks too. You got to pay it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe and you do too. Sin had left a crimson thing. He washed it white as snow. He died for us. He lived for us. And you get, you're getting this idea in Calvin and his successors. But the fuller work of the spirit that the, the Calvinists get, that Luther doesn't quite get, is to understand that there's not just an act. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, there's not just an act. There's not just an outward declaration. That's what we have in justification. It's a forensic, which is legal, outward declaration that we're righteous, not because of our own righteousness. We're not righteous in ourselves, but due to the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. So our sin is imputed to him. His righteousness is imputed to us, given so we bear, we wear it. But not only is that the case, he further sanctifies us so that we actually more and more die to sin and live to righteousness. What's called the big words, the fancy theologian words are vivification, living to righteousness, and mortification, dying to sin. But the Lutherans aren't as clear on that sort of stuff because this is more fully having to do with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. They're very good on the, they, they sort of carve out the justification part. They're good on that. They're right on the money. Or at least Luther and the first generation, I'm not, Lutherans nowadays have compromised with Rome. I don't know what you know about that, but they have. So that all has to be understood and qualified, okay? The, the main body of Lutherans. I mean, there are those Lutherans who haven't. Wisconsin Center. But there are those Lutherans who haven't. But there's a difference then between the Lutherans and the Calvinists. And the two main differences are, at the, the way I'm pointing them out, is that the Cal Calvin and the Calvinists, those who follow him, the Puritans, all of us who are Calvinists, 
we have a fuller understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Not just justification, but the whole package of what we talk about in the application of salvation when we talk about uh, regeneration and faith and repentance and justification, adoption. I mean, we can have a conference on that. It's a beautiful thing. Sanctification, right? Perseverance. And then ultimately to glorification. All of this is part of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It's all part of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So if you look at the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism, these documents are very much documents of, that are produced by a movement that understands the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is very prominent in those documents. And then the Synod of Dort that caps it off. These are the three forms of unity. Our, we have it all, right, in our new hymnal. The three forms and the Westminster Standards. Uh, and the key doctrine, really, of at Dort, the key doctrine there, the key issue there, is that of whether the work of the Holy Spirit is resistible or irresistible. That's really the key to the whole thing. If you, if you understand, I mean, if you want to debate that, oh, I think it's totally private. No, that was the, no it, it's, it's irresistible grace. Because the, the Arminians were teaching that God gave a provenient grace to... To, 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 to either everybody or many. They had, there were different views about that. But you could then, you could resist that grace or not. But going back to Calvin, um, excuse me, going back to Augustine, I think he has a doctrine of irresistible grace, understanding that it's God who brings you to life uh, and you have, you're his enemy. You're opposed to him. And he brings into your life a grace that you can't resist. That doesn't mean you come kicking and screaming. He, he changes your heart, he changes your will, he changes your affections, he changes these things. So you, you want this, although not perfectly so, because we remain, at the same time we're just, we remain sinners. And we have remaining sin, we have to deal with that. But the Synod of Dort is very key in this. And then you come to the Westminster Standards, and they add the other main plank. It's there in, in, in seed form, in the three forms, but it's developed in the Westminster Standards, which is the doctrine of covenant. So the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is really the key reformational contribution with Calvin and the Calvinists. Not so much Luther and the Lutherans, that's more justification by faith alone. But with Calvin and the Calvinists is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit more fully. And as that develops in the later part of the 16th century, then into the 17th century, and I'm not saying it's, it's at odds with what developed earlier. I think it's of a piece is the doctrine of covenant and to understand that there is a covenant of works that precedes a covenant of grace and possibly a covenant of redemption that's differently conceived either as something more distinct or as a kind of eternal aspect of the covenant of grace. There's different ways you can put that. But the point is, that, and that's not what I'm here to talk about, okay? There are plenty of people who have written plenty of books about all of this stuff. We need to get to Charles Hodge, and I've taken longer than, you know, the way it goes. I mean, I'm just trying to talk about the whole history here. So, um, Charles Hodge of Princeton, 17, his dates are 1797 to 1878, was certainly a theologian of the Holy Spirit. And I was going to talk more about the background to Hodge, the rise of Princeton, but just suffice it to say that the, the College of New Jersey, which becomes Princeton University, not until the late 19th century that takes that name. But the College of New Jersey is founded in 1746 out of the log colleges. There were various log colleges that existed among those of the first Great Awakening. And that ultimately coalesces and becomes Princeton uh, in 1746. Uh, Jonathan Dickinson is the first president. Uh, and then you have... Aaron Burr, the father of the scoundrel, uh, Jonathan Edwards, who is the grandfather of the scoundrel because he's Burr's father-in-law, uh, Samuel Davies, Samuel Finley, John Witherspoon. These are the first six presidents of Princeton. But what happens at Princeton is they come to see that Princeton, wonderful as it was in terms of training men, was originally to train men for gospel ministry but more and more as the latter part, as you come up to the time of the revolution, 1776, Witherspoon is there. And Witherspoon is a godly man, but politics is maybe as important for him as theology is. And there's a lot of people that aren't real happy with that because they feel like the seminary, or excuse me, there isn't a seminary, be real clear here. 
They feel like that the university is given to training men, not so much for the ministry, which was really what people were wanting in 1746, especially, right? Not so much training men for the ministry, but training men for civic life, to be leaders. James Madison, who wrote the Constitution, you know, went there. As in, we could talk, I mean, we could, we could have multiple lectures on all this stuff. Um, but basically what happens is they come to see the need for a distinct institution that's part of this, part of the university or associated with the university. They're not sure exactly how in the beginning, but ultimately it becomes its own distinct institution, what would become Princeton Theological Seminary. So Princeton University, it wasn't a university then, but Princeton is founded in 1746, and then the seminary is founded in 1812. So a few years back, they had their 200th anniversary. It's founded in 18. 18- 12. And Hodge, Charles Hodge, is the third professor there. The first professor there is Archibald Alexander. The second professor is Samuel Miller. And Charles Hodge is the third professor. He comes there um, in, he, he goes to Princeton College, or he goes to the College of New Jersey, and then he goes to the seminary there. And he becomes the professor of biblical languages, excuse me, he becomes an instructor in biblical languages. In 1820 and 21, he becomes the biblical professor there, uh, the professor of, of biblical languages and studies from 1822 to 40. So his first 20 years there, many people don't know this, because you think of Charles Hodge, you think of his three-volume systematic theology, and you think of Hodge as a great systematic theologian. He was a great systematic theologian, but he started out in the biblical studies department. He did not start out in the theology department. He started out in biblical studies because the first professor, Archibald Alexander, was the professor of systematic theology, uh, exegetical and didactic theology, they called it at the time. And he was the professor of that. But in 1840, he retired. And he had always had his eye on Hodge. He was really his spiritual mentor and father. Uh, Charles Hodge's father died when he was six months old. So he didn't have a father, and all of his siblings died except for his older brother, Hugh, who was not quite, was less than two years older than Hodge. Uh, And his brother, Hugh, uh, was a very great influence in his life. Hugh was a physician. Uh, He went to Princeton, but he became, he didn't follow the ministry path. He followed the path that his his father had been. His father was a doctor. In fact, his father, they they were a Philadelphia family. They were a fairly prominent Philadelphia family. Um, but his father had been treating uh, smallpox patients and had successfully done it in previous years, but then died, like I say, right when Charles was six months old. But his brother Hugh, who was about a year and a half, less than two years older than him, but throughout their life, it, 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 it would seem like he was quite a bit older, the way he looked up to him, the way he spoke about him and spoke to him and treated him, that is to say, Charles. Uh, I have a colleague who's, who's, you know, I don't know, I think he was trying to get my goat, and he, he keeps calling him Chuck Hodge. And I said, well, he wasn't called Chuck, but he was called Charlie. That is what he was called by close friends and his mother. He was called Charlie. So, you know, if you're wondering about that. Not Chuck, but Charlie. Um, so, um, but his brother Hugh became uh, a, uh, a gynecologist and obstetrician and uh, wrote an important text and pioneered some procedures that were key gynecological procedures for many, many, into the 20th century. Uh, so his brother was, was very well known um, in that field, in the medical field, and did quite well by himself. His brother was fairly well off. And uh, Princeton would not infrequently not pay Charles. They didn't pay a great deal. And they didn't always pay their professors. And so um, I've read all the correspondence between the brothers, and there's quite a lot. It's in the, I've, I've read a great deal in his papers, which are at Princeton, at the university. Uh, it's interesting that the university actually has as many of the papers as they do. Part of it was because the family thought Hodge was too important a figure to just be left to the seminary. <laughs> That's interesting. Because he was always on the board of the college, of, of the university. He was very interested in the university as well as the seminary. Um, but there's an extensive correspondence with his brother, and his brother um, 
it's quite interesting. If you're, if you're a little queasy, you don't want to really read the first part to the letters because he will say like, you know, uh, Mary had a frothy mucus, which was, and he describes in detail these physical ailments and because his brother's a doctor. So he's, he's, it's quite interesting. He's always giving these, these rather detailed things. And Hodge himself had serious help. I mean, he lived to 80. And I don't know if they put on his tomb, you know, I told you I didn't feel well, or I told you I was going to die, but he lived to be 80. But he, he may have been a bit of a hypochondriac. He had, even when young, he was, he was you know, and I've, I've sort of determined in my studies, and I, I, I mean, Reverend DeYoung might not, he might, I'm not making any comment about him or anybody, but uh, I have seen in my studies of when you look into ministers and you read their letters and their personal journals, uh, not a few of them seem to be, I don't know if they're necessarily hypochondriacal, but they seem, they seem that they might be. I mean, uh, Richard Baxter, when he said, I preached as near I should preach again as a dying man to dying men. You may know that quote. He thought for many years that he was actually dying. And when, as my wife said, one day he did. But <laughs> when he actually did die one day. He was like, you know, I told you, you know, see? Uh, but it gave a certain kind of urgency to his preaching. So, I mean, maybe that was just God's plan for Richard Baxter to make him, you know, the kind of preacher that he was. Um, but uh, so Hodge, Hodge uh, becomes systematic professor and serves in that role from 1840 to 1878 to his death. So for almost 40 years, he's the systematics professor. Uh, he becomes the principal uh, after Alexander. And his work uh, found focus in commentaries. Uh, he wrote commentaries uh, on Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Ephesians. He becomes quite an expert in Romans, in the book of Romans. And um, whenever he started the Biblical Repertory in Princeton Review, which was the for years and years the main journal published by Princeton, and he would when a when a book would come in on Romans, he would he would go right to Romans 5, 12 to 21 to see what it said, because he was very big on this parallel between Christ and Adam. And, you know, Christ Adam being the, the first federal head, and Christ being the last, and Christ undoing and and keeping and observing the covenant of works for us that Adam and we didn't observe. He was very keen on that. And so, and, and he was very, he knew the Romans literature very exhaustively. And so even when he was in systematics, you know, you can imagine the New Testament guy is like, oh, let me see that's on Romans. And Hodge is like, give it, <laughs> get away. I'm looking at it first. I got to, I got to see what this says. And you knew he was going to go to Romans 5 <laughs> to see what the commentator said about that. Uh, that's his own, that's his own admission. And he becomes the principal after Alexander dies. Uh, they didn't have a president. They called him principal, but so sort of the head of the faculty uh, from 1851 to his death. Um, just a few things from this article that I have on the personal side of Charles Hodge. I, I, put, I published an article back in um, 2012 in New Horizons, September 2012, an article where I talk about the personal side of Charles Hodge, which is just, again, you don't, it's the, that in chapter two, chapter two of the book is about a 40 page uh, look at his life and some of the key issues, particularly as it impacts the doctrine of spirituality of the church. Now, that's what we're going to talk about in the next talk. So if you're like, I want to hear more about that, you will. Don't worry about that. OK, you're going to hear more about that. But um, uh, so if you were to look at chapter two or to look at this article again, I've just given you what you need. If you don't know how to do that, you go on opc.org. That's the OP website. You can look in the archives. All of this stuff is there. And this is September 2012. And uh, I really wish I could read more of it to you. Uh, it's great stuff. I'm not, not saying my writing, but I quote a lot in this article from the, the letters and stuff that you don't have that hasn't been published. I mean, that's one of the things if somebody goes and reads stuff that hasn't been published that's written in hand. And, and let me say this. Just a lot of interesting little personal things I could say to you about Hodge. When Hodge didn't feel well, and he had this weakness in his right thigh and leg, that from 1833 to 36, he didn't leave his house much. And he had his students come into his study 
at the house, which is right on the campus. If you go to Princeton Seminary today, you can see it. There's Charles Hodge's house. It's right there on the campus. Um, and, but he had students come in while he would lecture in the study. Uh, sitting down, he had this chair that he sat in for like forever. And he would lecture to the students. And of course, at that point, he's only in his mid-30s. And he's going to go on to live to 80. So, but he's got this, this problem. But it's sometimes his brother would say things to him that sort of slightly exasperatedly that got you the idea that as the doctor speaking to the patient, he's like sort of saying, get over it or something. I mean, he's, he's not convinced. Hodge is convinced that there's something really wrong and he's probably dying. And his brother is like, you know, mm. <laughs> you know, of course, he's a doctor, so he's seen a lot of things, undoubtedly. But although he's an obstetrician, he's a little... A little different specialty there. But um, so Hodge, um, uh, Hodge, um, just one of the one of the reflections here. Um, Hugh, his brother, uh, both on his own initiative and at Charles' request, as I said, gave gifts to his brother. So Charles would sometimes just ask him for money and other times he would send him money. And um, in, in, in 1860, there's a great letter uh, November 22, 1860, the election has occurred. Lincoln has been elected. This is a really tumultuous time. Uh, South Carolina is already just about almost getting ready to secede at this point. Um, and uh, he sends, uh, Hugh sends Charles $400 for a new carriage. Now, $400 is a good bit of money. That's a good bit of money in 1860. And... Um, and Hodge is just, he, 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 his brother says, you need to get a new carriage. Hodge loved horses. Uh, he, he was very interested in farming, but liking horses, it was, I said this and some students said, well, that's very interesting. And I said, no, it's like liking cars. I mean, it, you know, horses had this role in their lives. I mean, it's not, it wasn't odd for a man to be very interested in horses. Just like, I mean, would you find it odd if a man were interested in cars? I mean, you know, people are interested in these sorts of things. But he sends him and he says, I want you to get a new carriage. And he basically gives him the specs. And Hodge, he's beside himself. He says, I never bought, this is the quote, I never bought anything but a second-hand carriage in my life. And I feel too old to begin to splurge now. If I get any such thing, I will label it all over a present from a rich friend. So you, you, can, you can see there's lots of stuff going on there. And, and stuff that you can respect. I mean, he's thinking, you know, I'm a minister and I'm a professor in this institution. To ride around in too fine a carriage isn't seemly. I mean, he obviously was not from the Joel Osteen or other types of people school. Like, you know, yeah, I'm traveling first class all the way, you know, just, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is how people used to look at things. You know, you, you yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be unseemly here. That's very much, very much Hodge. Um, and, uh, boy, there's more I could say there. But I want to take some time for some questions. Um, let me just say a little bit more. Uh, you can, you, I think you will enjoy that article if you take a look. Ba it, it, sort of the genius of where, what I say in it, meaning the summary. I, I say that and then people think they don't get what I mean by that. The, when you talk about the genius of something, you're talking about what, what, what marks it as it is. And the, the, what I'm arguing in this article is that um, Charles's mother and brother sort of viewed him as somewhat lazy, which is rather remarkable. His mother judging him by his brother, who was very reserved and very bookish, and Charles was more gregarious and outgoing, but certainly did his work in the books. And his brother would have been a lousy minister. I'm not sure he was a great doctor in terms of bedside stuff. He was a great researcher and wrote a, you know, a renowned book. I don't know how his patients were. I mean, I, I have had both kinds of doctors. I've had, I mean, doctors who treat me, who are, I, I, uh, who are brilliant, but they, they can't have a conversation with you, not, not because they're just being technical, because they don't know how to relate to people. They don't have a clue. I mean, they, they want to help people, and I'm happy for them because they're brilliant, and, and they can figure out what's wrong, you know, that's good. But it's also good to have a bedside manner, too. Um, and, and, and so Hodge was very gregarious, very loving, had many friends. And um, But there's a tension that arises between his mother, to a degree, and his brother, 
Uh, and they sort of regard Hodge as a bit too, too emotive and not thinking enough. I don't know. It's, I, I don't, um, it's an interesting thing. And, and even after he, he writes this letter to his brother in 1850, uh, his wife had died, his wife Sarah. Now, his, he, he, was, he had two wives, not at the same time. Sarah first, and she was a great-granddaughter of Benjamin Franklin. So he married into a very important Philadelphia family. And then the second was uh, Mary uh, uh, Hunter Stockton, and that was one of the most important New Jersey families. Um, by the way, her brother... She was, his wife was, second wife, was sister of the important Union general, uh, David Hunter, who did some significant things in, in emancipating slaves in areas uh, for war necessity. But he was a huge emancipationist. And he and Hodge had a great relation. He, it, here's an interesting one. It shows you his political connection. The military tribunal, you understand, I assume you understand this, that the assassins of Lincoln were tried before a military tribunal. Now, I know there's been all this, and you've all, maybe you're some of the types, it was terribly and all unjust. These things are all very debatable. I mean, before you rush in as expert historians, there's lots of sides to these things, okay? But General Hunter was the chairman, was the president of that military tribunal that tried the Lincoln assassins. Yeah, I think some of them did get a bum deal. I think there was some rush to judgment. But uh, I've heard a lot of criticism that it was a military tribunal. This was the last act of war, in a sense. John Wilkes Booth killing Lincoln, I mean, that was, it was very much part of the war. No question about that. Um, so at any rate, um, but, but, but Hodge is talking about his missing, uh, his wife Sarah, and he says... Uh, he talks about how much he loved her, and he says, um, and then he just stops in the middle of the letter, and he says, but I must stop these unavailing regrets. You have not much patience for them. This is his brother. And seem to think I ought to be good enough to forget. I put in brackets because I don't know what the word is there. It's not clear. Well, what I was going to say is, I started to say this earlier, whenever he didn't feel well, you could tell his handwriting, the, the worse he felt, the, the worse his handwriting got. And it, would, it got really, and I, I'd never seen anything like it. When he was younger and he wanted to marry his first wife, Sarah Bache, he wrote her mother, her father was dead. He wrote her mother basically saying, I want to marry your daughter. And his handwriting was the finest I've ever seen. In that letter, you can tell, I, I'm, I, I'm not, I should, I should get, I should let a handwriting expert see it because I think, it, it looks like his in a measure, but very well done. But he may have had an amanuensis. That may have been a copyist that he gave the letter to and had, because it's so well done. But you can tell because he's, he's trying to impress this woman and get her to say, oh, yeah, you can marry my daughter. You know, he's trying to uh, win, her, win her over. Um, but it's kind of sad here. He says, you have not much patience for them. And seem to think I ought to be good enough. To, I think the word is forget. Forget I ever had such a wife. I sometimes think it would be well for me if I could leave Princeton and never come back to it. She's so associated with everything here that no moment passes without some appeal from her. Two years later, he does remarry. And so he has a very happy remarriage. And as I say here, Hodge had a wonderful life in many ways and was deeply grateful to the Lord for all his blessings. But it's important to look at a few of these neglected matters, particularly the later tension with his brother, all I have read portray their relationship as idyllic so that we can that much the more appreciate Hodge as a man who faced trials, tribulations, and disappointments just like the rest of us. I, I have to say this. I'm very concerned. Too much of history among us is just what's called hagiography, lives of the saints. In other words, there are people who write about great Christian figures of the past and you can't relate to them. You can't identify with them. They don't seem to have problems. They don't seem to have struggles, doubts. Uh, and that's not true. They maybe don't even seem to need Jesus. And I tell my students that, you know, we're going to look at history as clearly and honestly as we can because my object is to have you run from this department in history to the other departments in theology and Bible and ministry crying eternal life, eternal life. I don't want you in this course to think, wow, I mean, 
John Calvin was amazing. I'm not even sure why he needed a savior. That's not true of any of us. That's not true of any of us. So I don't, I don't blacken them. No, we don't do that. We don't, we don't glory in that. But John Calvin, if you read him, he's very honest about what a temper he had. And how hard it was to control it. And so you need, we need to talk about that. Because maybe you do. I can certainly relate to that. I can relate to all these things. I can relate to what Hodge is talking about. Um, Hodge is a man who faced trials, tribulations, and disappointments. Um, but despite illness, church conflict, the terrible civil war, and the strained relationship with his mother and even his beloved brother, which tends to just get downplayed, um, I think that his remarkably optimistic demeanor, which one writer said he always maintained, was because of his unquenchable relationship with his Savior, which served him through all the ups and downs of life. It had to do with his walk with Christ. Not just, well, he was, you know, I deal with a lot of people, and people will say as I'm dealing with them and their problems, well, you know, if I was like that brother or that, oh, they got it easy. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. You have no idea what other people's lives are like. You scarcely know yourself. You sure don't know other people. You don't know them from the inside. Stop judging. Stop playing like you do. Be humble about it. Say, wow, there's a lot of stuff about my brother and sister that I don't know. And there's stuff about you that they don't know. But boy, we jump to, oh yeah, some people, our only exercise is jumping to conclusions. And, you know, history helps you with that. History helps you if you study it carefully and read it to be more measured, to, be, to, uh, to put things in the right context, and so forth. But Hodge, just to end here on this point, Hodge tended early on to resist the doctrine of the spirituality of the church, as we'll see it, as some abused it. Hodge developed his view of the spirituality of the church out of his doctrine of the Holy Spirit and the church. That's what I want you to know. And I particularly talk about Char Hodge's doctrine, the chapter 2 is about his life. Chapters 3 and 4 are very much about how Hodge develops his doctrine of the church out of his doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Remember, before the Reformation, it wasn't being developed out of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It was just going right to the doctrine of the church, right to the sacraments. And that's why they messed up. But when you develop the doctrine of the church out of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to be on the right track. And you see how Hodge does that. And... The church is a spiritual institution. It's not a civil institution like the state. It's not a biological institution like the family. And tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about some of the implications of this. We're going to be looking at Uzziah when he goes into the temple to offer sacrifice and uh, decides later that, whoops, that wasn't a good idea. Uh, you know, leprosy. Um, so, but we'll, this book will show you how Hodges... I've kind of tried to orient you in terms of the Reformation being a recapturing and developing of the doctrine of the work of the Holy Spirit and the covenants, but that especially, and how Hodge, like Calvin, is a theologian of the Holy Spirit, and this is where his stuff comes from. We don't have a lot of time, but I'll take a couple of questions. I'm gonna, there'll be more time in the next segment, because I just had to get us into this. There should be a little bit more time in the next segment.